just a warning. <laughs> I use a lot of scripture. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The Lord set me free from being before kindergarten addicted to all kinds of perversion, destroying my mind on all kinds of addiction, um, to the point where I cheated through high school just because I wanted to continue to feed my addictions. My high school diploma was illegitimate. I joined the military not for anything noble. It's because they all, it's the only thing I knew I could do and make a living. I felt stuck after I graduated high school. The weight of what happened to my brain and what I did to my life just set in. I'm like, oh, shoot. I got to figure out something to do. So I made the minimum score to get in the Air Force and uh, served six years in the Air Force. And my supervisor pushed me to go to college. And I hated it, but he made me do it. And it took, I crammed four years of school into about 10 years. Um, but fin finally finished, but I was still just a deadbeat student. You know, I was happy with the D, as long as I didn't have to repeat the class and I could graduate, get my paper at the end. But uh, the Lord set me on fire in the fall of 2009. And my life has not been the same. I fell in love with the God that I grew up hearing about, that I grew to hate. It's like I hated a man I didn't believe in at the same time. Like, how does that work? Wow. Um, but uh, he pulled me out of just the lazy atheism, as I call it, and just set me on fire. And he took me to the school of the Spirit, where he washed my mind with his truth, where he washed my mind with his love. I became addicted to prayer and Bible study. He taught me how to preach. No man taught me how to preach. I remember when we first moved here to San Antonio, uh, we were helping out a youth group uh, on the east side of town, and the youth pastor was like, man, Dave's really on fire. We should have him speak to the youth group. And I never preached, and I hate public speaking. I almost didn't get my degree if it weren't for being able to clap speech class. Because there's no way I'm going to do a speech class. And... Um, This youth pastor asked me, like, you should speak next month. And my body said yes, but my spirit's like, no, what are you doing? <laughs> or my mind was, rather. Yeah. And uh, I just walked away from that thinking, God, I don't know what to do. He's like, I'll, I'll teach you. But my warning is, I do use a lot of scripture. I'm not here for story time. I'm here for the word of the Lord. No. Oh, yeah. The essential value that the Lord placed in my heart and preaching his word is he told me my word is perfectly suited to support and illustrate itself so let's go somewhere today gird your loins let us run together i heard you guys have been in joshua 3 5 for a little bit said then joshua said to the people consecrate yourselves father i love you you're beautiful, you're awesome. I ask you for your word to be glorified, your son to be lifted up and magnified, Father. I thank you for the understanding that you've given all of us. I ask that you continue to release healing through wisdom and understanding over people in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your presence here today. I ask that your word would run swiftly and be glorified in our midst. I ask that you would open up hearts, unlock minds, bring us into a place of deep hunger. As we orient our hearts to assess how we are valuing the Lamb, who is worthy to receive the due reward of His suffering. Amen. This uh, phrase, consecrate yourselves, has uh, <laughs> been a stumbling block for many theologians and many Christians. You insert the word yourself in there and the conversation usually goes south right away. Like, what do you mean? I can't do anything myself. I can't save myself. We can't do anything myself. And we automatically begin to strip biblical responsibility from humanity because we're just these broken, weak vessels. And we don't realize the glory of what the Lord has called us up into. But here, Joshua, under a quote, what we would call an inferior covenant, is saying, consecrate yourself. You can do it. And he's echoing the sentiment of Moses as well at the end of the law when he sums it up in Deuteronomy. He says, these commandments are not too hard for you. You can do them. 
Why? Because Paul says in Romans 10, the word of faith is near you and in your mouth. Christ is here. Find him in the law. Find him in my precepts. Find him in my justice. Yeah. Find him in my truth. Drink with him. Digest him. Eat him. You can do this yourself. Consecrate yourself. But again, we've got a sea of philosophy and empty the uh, theology that would just affront the offended. And what do you mean i got to do this myself? But that's not what Paul told Timothy. He said, pay attention to your life and your doctrine. By doing that, you will save yourself and those who hear you. Or how about Ezekiel 18? The promise of the Spirit, Spirit also carries a personal responsibility on us as individuals. And God says at the end of Ezekiel 18, the second to last verse, says, get yourself a new spirit. How? Repent. Confess and forsake. Confess and forsake. You will find mercy. And so I kind of want to use consecrate yourself, that phrase as a springboard, to go to John 3 with you today and begin to speak about how we consecrate ourselves within the context yeah. of the new birth. Um, also, it's just kind of a parenthetical. I'm from the house of prayer in the city. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the prayer movement that's sweeping over the globe, but I know this is a praying church. We truly believe that the earth is in the middle of a mighty shift. Listen to this. Church as usual is over. It's over. God is taking prayer from the back room over there with a couple individuals and bringing it front and center. And the most attended, the most funded, the most powerful meetings that we're going to see in the coming days is the ministry of adoration, undergirding an intercession unto see Satan fall like lightning over our regions. Yeah. And it's going to be the praying, praising, adoring lips of the saints that are walking in full consecration with the Lord that are going to bring this about. Hearts burning in love with Jesus. Say no to lesser pleasures to say yes to the one on the throne. These are going to be given such authority in prayer. We're so washed with, you know, we're, we're all equal um, in the sense that there's no, no special Christian. Or, you know, uh, but these things have to be defined clearly so we can understand what we're talking about. Yes. Beloved, we all have equal access to the foot of the cross. Yes. Take heed. How you use that access will determine individual outcomes in this life yes. and in the life to come. Yes. We see the same thing with Martha and Mary and, and John when Lazarus died. Martha came running out to Jesus after he waited three days in the city that he was in. She came running out to Jesus and she falls, or she doesn't fall down, but she comes to Jesus. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. We know Jesus asked for Mary because Martha goes and tells Mary privately, the master is looking for you. This is supposed to be a private encounter, but Mary, because of her history at Jesus' feet, gets up with such zeal that it gets the attention of the Jews that are mourning with her in the room. And she runs out to Jesus, and we find her at her familiar spot at Jesus' feet. And what's astonishing, you'll see in that chapter, is she says the same exact words as her sister. She says, she prays the same prayer. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She's echoing the sentiment of confusion of why did you take so long? Why did you let my brother die? Yeah, I know you heal people. You could have done, you could have come sooner and done this. She's even echoing the confusion of those around her, but because of her history of intimacy with the Lord, of sitting at Jesus' feet, of choosing the good part that will not be taken from her, she says the same prayer her sister prays, echoes the confusion of the culture, but this time Jesus weeps, pulls Lazarus out of the grave, and converts this crowd of Jews that just followed her out to the grave. What we do with our access will determine individual outcomes in this life. Yeah. And beloved, this means everything when it comes to authority and prayer. 
It means everything when it comes to authority and prayer. And so this shift that we're seeing in the church is going to be marked by love and holiness. A real love that fuels holiness, a happy holiness. Holiness is happiness and joyful. It's beauty. The Old Testament calls it beauty of holiness. That the priests would come before the Lord in the beauties of holiness. You've been given clean garments for beauty and glory, it says. As a priesthood before the Lord. And so we're going to be marked by things like consecration. Like, no, I don't want to watch that. No, I don't want to go that. That might be a good thing, but I'm going to say no to that and lay those things down. Because I want to be with Jesus. Because I'm madly in love with him. And I'm a bond servant of Christ. And he's madly in love with you. And he wants to know you. The first commandment, the greatest commandment, right? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God is a lover and he wants you close. He could have... Said anything is the greatest commandment. But it's all about love. It's all about love. And these markers of holiness and love and consecration, a true love for God, a real living practical holiness, not an ethereal holiness of, well, my spirit's clean, well, my body's a slave to sin. Beloved, that's great philosophy and does not belong in the church, in our thinking, or in our pulpits, or in our practice. First John says, if he abides in you, you cannot sin. And it doesn't denote an inability, but think of you having a Lamborghini, and you go to the McDonald's drive thru and someone says, hey, I'll give you 10 bucks for your Lamborghini. What was your response to you? I can't do that. Why? Because of the worth of the car you're driving. That would be stupid. It would be insane. So it's the same thing when the tempter comes. When you know the value and the worth of the lamb on the throne. Come on. When the tempter comes at his opportune time. It's like five bucks for a Lamborghini. I can't do that. That's dumb. There's no way you're going to put me down that road. But that only comes as we orient our lives to sit at the feet of Jesus like Mary did. The th thing that led me into atheism, and I grew up in churches like this, the thing that led me into atheism was I was waiting for God to zap me one day so that I would know he's real and I would then be on fire. When I met the Lord, he showed up in an undeniable way, but he did not show up to you know zap me and give me what I'm looking for. I said, God, I want to know you more. Do you know what his response to me was? Read my word. <laughs> Learn how to grow up and mature. Take a hold of eternal life, Paul says. Take a hold of it. Action verb. Consecrate yourself. Action verb. We cannot wait for God to just show up in his Sovereignty, as we call it. God's not a puppet master. He didn't die for puppets. He died for his bride. To raise up burning, willful love inside the hearts of his people. At the heart of this, though, it does come back to the issue of worth. How much is Jesus worth? How much is Jesus worth? Or make it more personal. What is he worth to you? Because we could put an objective price tag on Jesus. Say he's worth an infinite amount of whatever. But what is he worth to you? And the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit from Galatians 5 would be the telltale sign of how much... Jesus is worth to you in your practical living. This is the central issue that we must all soberly deal with. Because, listen to this, our hearts all move and, re and respond according to our internal value systems. Whatever price tag you place upon an object or a person, this will dictate your emotions and your weird, uh, real world responses towards people and things including God. This is why Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, don't store up treasures for yourself on earth 
but store up for yourself treasures in the heavenlies. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know what he's saying there? Whatever is valuable to you will dominate your emotions. And then whatever dominates your emotions will direct your foot. Where your treasure is, your heart is. So here it is. The value you place on God will direct your heart accordingly. And the degree that your heart is moved is the degree that practical holiness and the consecration of yourself will be manifested in your life with joy. Again, it's a joyful thing. There's nothing like the extreme euphoria and the ecstasy of walking before the Lord in intimacy and a clean conscience. And that's part of being born in the water in John 3 that we're going to talk about. But uh, it is for these reasons that I want to speak with you from the springboard of John chapter 3. And so I want to build a little bit of context. We know in John chapter 2, Jesus is at the wedding of Cana. And his mother pulls a miracle out of him after he says it's not his time. But uh, it's, it's interesting, after that miracle... At the wedding, Jesus has weddings on his mind. So where does he go for his next act? He goes inside the temple to cleanse the temple. To turn over the tables of the money changers. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Stop it. He cleansed the temple multiple times. This wasn't a one-time act. At least two we know of. A uh, argument can be made in the Gospels for a third time that he cleansed the temple. This is the first time. He's got weddings on his mind. And he knows he's going to come back one day in the clouds and consummate the marriage with his bride in Jerusalem on that very spot. And he comes and begins to put in place the wedding preparations. And then after that it says in verse 23... says when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name because they were observing the signs that they were doing. So his mother, even though it wasn't Jesus' time, opens up the ministry and signs and wonders begin to flow out of him. And then we have John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Get a load of what's going on. He's not just a curious onlooker. He's a man of the Pharisees. Here comes Jesus cleansing the temple with signs and wonders following. And he comes to him by night. This is a secretive meeting. The Jews want to know because they're under Roman control, looking for the Messiah who's going to free them from Roman control. They want to know who this man is, because are we going to back you? Is this the overthrow of Rome? Or are you just another crazy person, and we're going to turn on you and kill you so that we can continue to show our loyalties to Rome? And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. So no one can do these signs unless God's with him. <coughs> Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Yeah. Beloved, I, if I could shift kind of the perspective that we have of being born again, I believe in being born again. I believe in the new creature. But set yourself on a pilgrimage. I thank the Lord for one-time encounters, but you weren't created for one-time encounter. God's eternal. You are created to eat and digest him and continually be transformed in his image as you behold him going from glory to glory to glory. Amen. Hallelujah. And so 
I would say I'm being, I've been born again, but I'm being born again. Yeah. I'm also being born again. And so I want you to see the process that this is. And see that what Sister was talking about at the Bible study. Like, do you have saving faith? But then do you also accompany that with staying faith? Are you posturing yourself to overcome into the end? Because it's those who overcome to the end. They sit with him on his throne. They are clothed with white. They are given a rod to exercise authority and justice over the nations. Those who overcome. Not by their time. Overcome. To the end. To the end. So Jesus says, unless you're born of water and the spirit of those of you taking notes, Hebrews 10.22 clearly lays out our responsibility to respond to what the Lord has done as we draw near. We have our conscience clean with pure water. Uh, this is also the promise of the spirit that the disciples and the apostles were looking for, experienced, and wrote about. And I would say even some of the Old Testament examples we have latched onto this promise of the spirit. As they encounter the goodness and the mercy of God under the Old Covenant. But you can find this promise of the Spirit in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27 as well. Where God says, I'm going to wash you with water and you'll be clean. I'm going to put a new heart in you. I'm going to put a new mind in you. I'm going to write my laws on your heart. I'm going to write my law on your mind. So that you'll be careful to do that. Oh, and we're going to be in love. While we're doing this, you're going to love me for my justice. You're going to love me for my mercy. You're going to love me for my beauty and my glory. And so it's that encounter of being born again that you're continually pressing into. And ultimately what it means to be born again is you have your innocence restored like a child. Yeah. And this is why in verse 6, Jesus says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Uh, spirit. Do not be amazed that I said you must be born again. Why? Because you're born innocent. Sin is a liar and a thief, and it has come in and killed you and brought death to every man. Because all have sinned, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So come near to me. Get close to me. Set your gaze upon me, as we'll see below. Be born again. Be born of the Spirit. Have your conscience clean with pure water. And your innocence will be restored like a child in you. So don't be amazed, he says. Verse 8 is a peculiar verse. He says, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it. But you're not, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So he's talking to Nicodemus. He's like, don't be amazed at this. Why do you not know? You're a teacher of the law. You should know these things. And so we're born in the spirit. We're blowing around. You hear the commotion we're making, but you have no idea where we come from. You're a teacher of the law. You don't know Ezekiel 36, 25, and 27. I'll put a new spirit in you and put a new heart in you. Be born again. Nicodemus is still in verse 9. How, do these, how are these things going to be? Jesus answered to him and said, Are you not a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we've seen. And you don't accept our testimony if I told you earthly things. And you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whosoever believes in him has eternal life. And now the most familiar Bible verse in all of Christian history. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Beloved, we know this verse so much that we have no clue what it means anymore at large in the church. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I don't have time to get into all of it, but just a couple observations on that last line. Whoever believes, they shall not perish, but have eternal life. What we do with that last line is we often see it as opposite ends of the same war. I'm not going to die, therefore I live forever, right? That's not what he's saying because Jesus defined his own terms of eternal life later on in John in 17. He defines what perishing is when he showed up to John 
in all of his glory with hair white like wool, a golden sash, a robe down to his feet, eyes of fire, feet like burnished bronze. He says in Revelation uh, 21, 8, he talks about the second death. The cowards, the sorcerers, the idolaters being thrown into the lake of fire. He's talking about the second death. But if you believe, you won't have to experience the second death. You'll have eternal life. And this is eternal life, Jesus says in John 17, 3, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who was sent. It's interesting, in Jesus' definition of eternal life, there's no mention of existing forever. That's a given. Beloved, every man and woman will exist forever. I'll even one-up that. We're all going to burn forever. We just get to pick where. And if we're going to be oriented towards enjoying it or not. This is why Isaiah asks, who can dwell with everlasting burnings? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood. So eternal life has nothing to do with your longevity of existence. We all have that. It's the quality of eternity. It's the life that comes from an intimate relationship with the Lord that is paid to get back for you. It's the life that's exchanged between knowing Him as a friend, as the Lord says of Moses. I think it's interesting. We have this kind of prophetic culture in the church. Everyone wants to be a prophet. And the Lord said, I, and I don't want to despise prophecy. I love prophecy. But the Lord did say, if there's a prophet among you, I'll speak to him in dark things and riddles. Not so with Moses. He's my friend. I talk to him face to face. Plainly. I want that. We have a better covenant. We have a better covenant. We have been purchased access to draw near to the Holy Holy. To speak to him face to face as a friend. My goodness. My goodness. Don't squander the access and then redefine that as grace. I beg you. And then the word eternal, it's eternal because God's eternal. That means he has the capacity to blow your mind and keep you entertained forever. You won't get bored of God. And if you do, you're not looking at him. I'm tired of hearing God being presented as some old dude that's got to come up with these new gimmicks to wow our, like, some 21st century weirdo. He's eternal. Our call in this generation is come out of Babylon and look at him. Come out of Babylon and look at him. No reasonable being is bored in the presence of God. So with this definition as a backdrop, go back with me to chapter uh, verses 14 and 15. Is really the meat of where I want to get to today with you. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whosoever believes will in him have eternal life. And what's eternal life? Whosoever believes will have eternal life. Verse 14 and 15 in Jesus' discourse with Nicodemus shows us how to be born again. It's the how to. It, and verse 14 sets the context for our response. So God makes provision for us in verse 14 that we could never do on our own. We cannot do verse 14. But then in verse 15, we have an irreplaceable role, which is our responsibility, to respond to verse 14 so that we can be born from above. So again, verse 14 is everything because it sets the context for our response. Again, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The story comes from Numbers 21. 
And uh, you'll turn there with me. We're going to spend a little bit of time in the Old Testament. I like to start in verse 5 because it's just a funny verse to me. I get a kick out of it every time. It says that people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? And this is what cracks me up. There is no food and no water and we loathe this miserable food. <laughs> Which is it? They're so irrational, they're, they're not even making sense when they're complaining. Do you have no food or do you hate the food? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Make up your mind. Which one is it? At least be consistent in your complaint toward the Lord. <laughs> so verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people died. So the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord. And you intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a standard. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he gazes upon it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent. Set it on a standard or a pole. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. I think it's interesting. They asked Moses, tell God to make these serpents go away. God does not say, okay. He doesn't remove the serpents. But he makes a provision for the people to come out from the midst of them. Now remember, Jesus is using this story, this serpent, as an image of himself and his ministry. So that's why I waited until now to tell you the title of the sermon so you don't get mad at me. It's called Jesus' is Serpent. It would be a heck of a worship song, wouldn't it? Maybe we won't do that because visitors. <laughs> But Jesus uses this image to be an image of himself, to talk about his mission, what he's going to do, that would give an imagery to his ministry when he comes. And in Numbers 21, we see that the people responded to this bronze, bronze ser serpent by fixing their gaze, or you could say looking intently. I like that phrase because James uses it when he's talking about Bible study. Those who look at the perfect law, look intently at the perfect law of liberty. I want you to imagine this. This was no nice get along with everyone line. This was not a casual gaze. Beloved, this was life or death. I mean, the news every Black Friday puts up videos of how crazy Black Friday can get. At the opening of these stores, right? Beloved, imagine if one Black Friday they sold the cure for cancer. Five dollars. Imagine with the line and the chaos and the tearing one another down to get and to be able to just have a chance at life. And Jesus takes this story and says, that in that life and death situation, the serpent was lifted up. Now there's a greater life or death situation facing all of you right now. And I'm going to be lifted up. And whoever fixes their gaze upon me will live. They will know me. They will have eternal life. And so notice in Jesus' example in John 3, 14 and 15, he's using the words believe and fix your gaze as synonymous terms. So it's more than just a mental ascent. It's a reorientation of your entire life to lay things down to fix your gaze on them so that you can get to know him and experience eternal life. And then overcomes the end and be saved. We're saved from our sin in this life. We're saved from the wrath of God to come when he comes back to destroy those, it says in Revelation, who destroy the earth with their sin and idolatry and sorceries. There is a fight to behold this serpent. 
Beloved, is there a fight in your life to behold Christ? Again, this is no mere head agreement. This is the orientation of life. Saying no to 10,000 good things. To say yes to Christ. Fixing your gaze is simple. It's just laying those things down to enjoy God. How he prescribed. Get to know me in my word. Read the Bible. Ask me stuff. Talk to me. Pray. That's all prayer is. Just conversation. With your friend. Talk to him. Don't have to be like super religious and liturgical about it. Just talk to him. Share your heart honestly. Mm -hmm. Just gazing upon Jesus. Gazing upon his beauty. If there's any duty that resembles the duty of the saints of heaven that should be our occupation, it would be that. Gazing upon Jesus. Gazing upon his beauty. This is why Paul prayed that our hearts would be oriented towards Christ and therefore filled with light. Now I want to uh, go somewhere as I'm kind of on the downhill slide with you guys and see what ultimately happened to this bronze serpent. Again, that is an uh, image of the precious lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, come with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. This is one of my favorite chapters in all of scripture. It's got one of the most amazing kings of Judah in all of scripture, King Hezekiah. His revival was like no other revival. It said that he did right in the sight of the Lord. He did everything that his father David had done. What that means is he actually put the Davidic worship order back in the temple. So a little bit of Israel, ancient Israel history. Lord uh, saves them from Egypt, gives them the tabernacle of Moses. When they get into the promised land, the tabernacle of Moses and that liturgical worship order continue to function in different places like the high place of Gibeon where they continued the sacrifices, but David was eaten up with something. He was eaten up with a presence and a pattern that was shown him for a worship war. And he sets up the tabernacle of David for 27 years that dethroned every enemy that they had, propelled Solomon to his success. And you know what he did with his worship order? He took the Ark of the Covenant, broke all the Levitical codes to put it in the middle of a tent, no veils, surrounded it with 388 singers, 4,000 musicians, to 24-7, day and night, unceasing, surround the presence, surround the Lord with worship, prayer, praise, proclamation, prophecy, declarations. It's where we get the book of Psalms from. And so David hands off this pattern to Solomon, and Solomon builds the temple. What the temple was, was a permanent structure that combined the worship order of Moses' tent and the worship order of David's tent. So there would be kings that would come and do good things for the temple, but it was rare that you would have a king after an idolatrous king that would reinstate not just Moses' order of worship, but David's order of worship, which is important, beloved. Amos 9-11, God says, in the last days, I'm going to restore that worship order. Why? So that all mankind will know you. Isaiah talks about the whole globe being filled with praise and worship and songs that's going to stir his zeal to come back in justice. Isaiah 24 is one of my favorite spots. It says the city of chaos is being torn down, but from the end of the earth we hear songs. Glory to the righteous one. The Lord is raising up day and night worship again in our city. We know that we are a New Testament priesthood. And we know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that day and night worship should rest on us as individuals. And it is going, it is beginning to rest on us corporately as we come together to magnify the one to the throne and declare his will in our regions. And so when I read Hezekiah, I'm really like you can see an example of even a New Testament revival in his language to the priesthood. 
And Hezekiah restores the temple, restores this divinic order of worship, put the singing Levites back in their place, all in a week. It's at the end of the chapter, it said the people were astonished because this thing came about suddenly. And so you can read through his instructions. I'm not going to read through the whole chapter just uh, for time's sake because I want to get somewhere. But he says in verse uh, 16, he tells the priests before they can put this worship back in the temple where it belongs. He tells the priests that went in to the inner part of the house of the Lord. He says, cleanse it and every unclean thing which they found in the temple of the Lord, they brought out of the house of the Lord. And then the Levites received it to take it to the Kidron Valley. Which is just the valley on um, the west side of Jerusalem where their dumping ground was. It was just a city dump. They carried these things to the trash. And then in verse 19 it says, Moreover, all the utensils that uh, King Azaz has di had discarded during his reign in his unfaithfulness, they prepared, they consecrated those vessels, and then they became useful for the service at the altar of the Lord again. So they took out the things that did not belong. They put the things in that did belong. <clears throat> he put the singing Levites back in place. And you can read through this time period on your own time. This is one of the most amazing revivals in all of the nation's history. I wanted to uh, go over that background as we go to 2 Kings Chapter 18. Um, first and Second Chronicles is kind of a rehash of what we read in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. So the Samuels and the Kings are all one long story. You have First and Second Chronicles that cover that same story again. The difference is Samuel's about David's life. The Kings tend to focus mainly on the kingly accomplishments and victories and war. Where the Chronicles tends to focus more on the priesthood. So you have priesthood lineages in there, and you have more details, um, especially in that chapter we were just out, about what Hezekiah's instructions were to the priest. And so it focuses on how the kings treated the house of birth. <coughs> but uh, even so, in 2 Kings 18, we have a key piece of information. Uh, talking about Hezekiah's revival again in verse 4, it says he removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah. Seems all routine for a good king to get rid of idolatry. But here's what's curious. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. That glorious image of Christ, of the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, who takes away the sins of the world. He takes this serpent out. As an unclean thing and breaks it in pieces. Why? For until those days, the sons of Israel, they burned incense to it, and it was called Nahushtan. If you have a Bible that has translator notes in there and your footnotes, you'll see that Nahushtan just means a piece of bronze. Or just a bronze thing. It's just a thing. Just a piece of bronze numbered with the other idols. And this was an image of Christ that became just common and despised among the people. Beloved, treating something as common is God's definition of hatred. That's biblical hatred. We judge it more based on emotional content. I really feel like loathing towards that. God defines hatred as you treat it as common. You despise it. You think too lightly of it. That's hatred. But they continued to burn incense to it. Beloved, they went to church. They even probably played on the worship team. But in their hearts, it was just another thing in a long list of other idols that kept their attention and affection divided. But Hezekiah... Who did what David did. He restored the true worship. And he carried out every unclean thing from the temple. And included was this casual view of Jesus. He carried this casual, contented view of Christ. Out of the temple. Broke it into pieces. And put it in the trash can. 
Beloved, we're facing the same thing in our day. There is an all-out war over the identity of the Christ, of the identity of Christ, and his value and his actual worth. The church at large has become so casual with Jesus that we just reduced him down to a buddy or a homeboy. Or he's that really cool boss at work that everyone likes because this boss that everyone likes doesn't hold anyone to account. I can show up late and it'll be all right. Like, he don't care. He understands. He'll even high five me when I get there. He's the good boss. He's the buddy that never holds you to account. Beloved, but faithful are the words of a friend. We don't like that Jesus. He will wound us and afflict us even in his faithfulness. But David knew that. That's why he says it's good for me to be afflicted so that I can learn. He's my best friend. And I would say he's my husband. But if there's not a shock and awe resting on my mind and my heart that accompanies infinite love for him, we're not seeing him right. We're picking and choosing and we're not eating the whole Passover lamb. We're eating the parts that we want that taste good. Beloved, it's time for a fresh revelation of the knowledge of God and the value of Christ to fill our hearts and stun us into worship. Many of us don't feel like we're in love with the Lord because we have not assessed how we value Him. It's the same thing in the natural. Like in one sense, I'm not moved by what I see and feel when it comes to like faith stuff. No, the Lord said He's going to do it. But when it comes to relationship, beloved, I'm moved by how I see and feel. If I don't feel tender inside, if I don't feel like I love Him, it's time to reassess my value system and how much worth am I attributing to Him. And it works the same way with my life. When I feel myself, quote, as we say, growing out of love, I just reorient to how I value her. Like, no, she's a treasure, and I treat her as such, and my emotions follow suit. Remember, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But we've got this huge disproportion of value. Can you go through an exercise with me real quick? Close your eyes. You're really hungry for fresh fries. You're pulling through the Burger King drive-thru. And everyone has that pay, you know, uh, pay for your meal on your phone with the app now. And you get an extra large fresh fry, and you are hungry for these Burger King fresh fries. You pull up to the drive-thru window, and the attendant at the window, or at the window hands you the box of French fries and one happens to fall on the ground. Mm -hmm. What would your response be? That's no big deal. I gotta I just give them to me for good. <laughs> one French fry falls to the ground, no one even feel it. But you go to pay. You hand them your phone. They drop your phone and your screen breaks. Mm -hmm. What does your heart feel there? <laughs> Ouch! I paid for that! It's valuable! It's worth something! <laughs> the value many of us place on Christ is absolutely preposterous and insane in the eyes of heaven. <laughs> There's one seated on the throne who wraps himself in light. In his light, we see light. There's an emerald rainbow surrounding his throne. And the one with eyes of fire and his feet of bronze, he's sitting with him on his throne. Here's what's more crazy. One of the promises to the church is if you overcome, is Jesus says, if you overcome at the end, you get to sit with me on my throne just as I sat down on my father's throne with him. Think about this. Angels take orders at the throne. You have a promise to endure to the end and you get to sit with him on it. What in the world? Who are we? Who are we? Yeah. That's just shocking to consider. But all of heaven's hosts are surrounding this throne, singing and proclaiming the beauty and the majesty of who he is. 
the way we value Christ on earth by our lives and by our deeds and by our words and the things that we're consumed with is insane in their eyes. It's absolutely insane. Beloved, the Lord has these creatures, four of them, that surround his throne with eyes everywhere, all over their body. You pull up their shirt, you get more eyes. There's eyes down here. It says they have eyes all around, without, and they have eyes all within. So they have the capacity more than anyone to be able to search on the exterior of God, search him on the insides, search him next to the Holy Spirit. These are the closest ones that can see things of his heart, see exterior things of his beauty and his glory and his virtue. And we know we at least have record of them in Isaiah 6. Crying out, holy, holy, holy. And every time they do, it says, the foundations of the temple shake. And they're crying out, holy, 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 because they're stunned. They're not bored. And we know we've been singing that song at least for 736 years. Because when John shows up, he's singing, singing them, singing the same song in Revelation 4 and 5. Holy, holy, holy. They have the most capacity of all creation to get bored in God. And he's still stunning them with one word. We sing the same worship song for three or four weeks straight. We're like, can we do a new song now? My Lord. Now imagine with me, if one of those beings came down Filled our pulpits. What would they preach on? And would we not just be all out shocked if we could even maintain consciousness? Would we not be shocked at their description of him who sits on the throne? Would we not be stunned as they describe his beauty and his glory and his infinite value? They would stun us with descriptions of God. But again, what's more shocking is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm not going to turn there, but you can read it on your own. We have access to God himself. We have access to something closer than those beings with all those eyes. It says the Spirit of God searches the depths of God, and only he fully knows the mind of God. He searches these depths. He searches the heart and the mind of God. And what does he do? It is his joy and absolute delight to reveal those things to the spiritual people. <coughs> so then the question to you is, do you value him enough to the point where you will rearrange your life? Even what we would call dedicated on fire Christianity here in the West. To rearrange your life to gaze upon him. So that you truly can become born of water and the spirit. And have your innocence restored. How much is he worth to you? The answer to that, whatever it may be, will direct your heart accordingly. The price tag you put on Jesus will direct your heart accordingly. And so, in closing, I just have this final exercise. Just consider it. The hypothetical of all hypotheticals which we know can never exist, but just go, go with it. If God were to vanish, just disappear in the moment, and we could hold together, what would it cost to replace him? Really, this is like how insurance adjusters and people try to consider the value of objects. And, well, if it was removed, how much would it cost to replace if God was removed, how much would it cost to replace him from your life? Let's 
stand and uh, just finish in prayer. My final prayer for you all and so many in the West is Paul's prayer from Colossians 2. It says, I want you to know how a great struggle I have on your behalf. And for those who are at Laodicea, remember that lukewarm church, for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts would be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth, get this, all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom, in Jesus, are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Beloved, who's hungry? Who's hungry? I want God. Do you want God? Do you want Him? Beloved, Isaiah 55 says it doesn't cost Him money. So quit spending your money on things that don't satisfy. He says, come and buy from me. How do you do that? You have the currency of your time, your attention, and your affections, and you can direct them all accordingly. Go buy from him with your time. Lord, I love you. I ask you for increased hunger to wash over this place in the name of Jesus. I ask you to deeply wound us in the heart Produce the cry in us. God, I got to have more. I'm thankful for what I have, but God, you're eternal. I want more. There's no way that this is it. Father, we want your spirit in our city. Father, we ask you for a move of the spirit in the midst of a hungry people that will begin to pull on you in prayer, that will begin, that will contend for righteousness in our city, that will dethrone every demon and idol from San Antonio. In the name of Jesus, I ask you to pour your spirit out on this house and these individuals. We thank you for equipping us for the journey. We set our hearts on pilgrimage to know you, to be found in you. We thank you for grace to overcome to the end. We love you.